Okay, everybody should get a little message allowing me to record. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. Last time we were talking about um, kind of uh, my kind of a overview of artificial intelligence and where I think we are today. You have to realize that if you that if you um, mess around with other people and you talk to other people, they're going to have they're going to have other opinions. But this is my opinion, and I have been in this field for thirty years, so I'm appealing to my expertise. So we'll see how that is. Let me go ahead and get the PowerPoint up here. Okay, we ended up last time talking about logical illusions. Logical illusions. Let me share my screen. Okay. You know what? I don't know if I shared the right thing. I just wanted to share the PowerPoint. So I wanted to share the PowerPoint only. Okay. So there you should have the PowerPoint. Is that what you're getting? Do you see the PowerPoint? Okay, that's good. And then I, I need to put it in presentation mode. And uh, oh my gosh, all of this uh, Zoom verbiage is, is keeping me from putting it in the presentation mode. So I have to go back to this and hit this, and there we go. Now, we, we talked about last time about so-called logical illusions. These are self-contradictory illusions. We contrasted them with... Um, with the idea of optical illusions and uh, audio illusions. And we played the, I think it's called a glissando, where that tone kept on rising, but it really didn't. I, th I always thought that was very interesting. And we did this thing about the proofs. Then we start to get to, get to something which starts to look serious. And that's Barry's paradox. X is the smallest uh, positive integer that requires that requires more than 20 words to define. Okay, that seems like a very innocent statement, but it's innocent until you realize that, hey, we have just we have just defined that word X by this sentence. We have you we, we have used this sentence here. This sentence defines the word X, and this sentence uh, requires, can you see on the bottom of your screen? I can't. How many words, how many words are in here? Uh, 15. 15. Okay, so there's 15 words. So believe it or not, this seemingly innocent statement is kind of self-contradictory. And you might think that, well, you know, that is... Um, that is something which, um, you know, is, is just kind of curious, but it does have application, especially in the world of algorithmic information theory. And if you're interested in information theory, I offer a graduate course in that. And you will find out that some of the stuff in algorithmic information theory is more fun than any science fiction that you ever read in your life. And much of the work was done by Gödel, uh, Turing, people like Gregory Chaitin, Ray Solomonoff, just fascinating stuff. And it's very different from the information theory that you're used to, like Shannon information, where Shannon information is used how to communicate over a noisy channel and such. Um, but the algorithmic information theory deals with the length of programs. So let me give you an example of a length of programs. Here, here are some things which are not algorithmic as dictated by a logical illusion. Um, one of them is a so-called elegant program. Now, here's, here's the idea of an elegant program. Let me give you a little background. You're all familiar with 3D printers. Anybody ever used a 3D printer? Okay, I, I haven't. Do you have to program it? You have to program it to do something unless it's a 3D computer. Okay, let's suppose that you did have to uh, program it. Now, you wanted to print two different things. One of the things you wanted to print was a detailed bust of Abraham Lincoln, including a little wart and his chin and his whiskers and his hair. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing you would want to print is that you would want to print a bowling ball. 
Which program do you think is going to be the longest? The program for the bowling ball or the program for Abraham Lincoln's head? No one wants to guess? Abraham Lincoln, unless you assume a perfectly spherical Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> a perfectly spherical Abraham Lincoln, yes, yes. Um, yeah, it would be Abraham Lincoln would be the longest because you would have to write in the program all of the details about the, his bust, uh, the, you know, the little, the little mole he had on his cheek and uh, everything else. I mean, that, that takes a lot, a long program. We're in, we're in for example, a, um, a program to print a bowling ball is pretty simple. You print a sphere and put three holes in it. That's a really short program, right? So therefore, we can say in algorithmic information theory that the bust of Lincoln is more computationally complex than a bowling ball. Does that make sense? Because it takes a longer program to specify it. Now, here's the other thing which is interesting. If you and I were both writing a computer program to generate a bust of Lincoln, we would probably write different computer programs, right? Now, here's the thing. Your program might be shorter than mine, correct? Now, and um, Sam's, Sam's might be shorter and Matthew's might even be shorter. Um, Bing Kuhn could have a, a sh much shorter program. And we ask ourselves, for example, uh, what's the shortest program that can generate the bust of Abraham Lincoln? What is the shortest program? And the shortest program is a measure of the so-called Kolmogorov complexity. It's also called the kolmogorov chaitin solomonov complexity. And it's something which is measured in bits, just like information theory, right? Because the length of that program is going to be so many bits long. So for a given output, the shortest computer program is said to be elegant. Now, you know, there is a shortest computer program because you know you can't write a program of one bit. You know that you can write it as the program that you wrote. So the shortest program must be between what you wrote and that one bit. Agreed? So there has to be a shortest program that you would use to print out a bust of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Gregory Chaitin, who is one of the greatest geniuses in mathematics of the 20th century, calls these programs elegant. They are the best you can do. They, they are the shortest programs that you can possibly do. Um, and we won't go into the details here of what all of this means, but this uh, idea of the shortest program was simultaneously introduced to the literature by the three people, Komogorov, Chaitin, and Solomonov. Now it turns out there's something called the Matthew Principle. Anybody ever heard of the Matthew Principle? What, what's a Matthew Principle, Matthew? <laughs> uh, to him who has much, much will be. That's right. And it turned out at this time, Gregory Chaitin, when he formulated his work, was only out of high school. Kolmogorov, the Russian, the Russian uh, mathematician, however, was world famous. He had come up with the uh, axiomatic uh, mathematical theory for probability, just world famous. So because of the Matthew principle, to, to him who has shall be given, uh, this was named after Kolmogorov, although historically that probably isn't true. They were independently discovered. Well, that's an interesting question. Do you think math is discovered or invented? This gets into a philosophical argument that we don't want to spend a lot of time on. But I think that those that say that mathematical is discovered as opposed to invented can talk to mathematics, which is generated independently by different people at different, point, at different times, uh, maybe not at different times, but geographically separated so that one didn't know what the other one was doing. And that to me suggests that mathematics is kind of discovered that it's already there. And we see a lot of hyphenations in the literature about this. Uh, one that we use is the 
Moore Penrose inverse discovered by Roger Penrose and a guy named Moore independently, a Carhunan Loeb expansion. Um, you're familiar with the sam sampling theory, uh, those of you that would have 3335. That was independently discovered by a bunch of people uh, Shannon, Whitaker, um, Katelnikov, a, a Russian mathematician, another, uh, so another Russian mathematician. So that leads me to believe, at least that is evidence, that mathematics is discovered. It's there and it's waiting to be discovered. Very interesting philosophical argument. So here's something which is not algorithmic uh, and something which is unknowable and something which we can prove by a logical illusion. We want to generate an elegant program length uh, generator. This should be generator up here. This should be generator. Uh, and what the idea is, is that for any program output, say the bust of Lincoln, that program will not generate the corresponding shortest program, but only the length of the shortest program. It doesn't generate the entire program. It just generates the length of that shortest program. It turns out that this is um, non-algorithmic. It's something which you cannot prove. And we won't go through, the, I, through it, but it, it, well, I guess we can talk about it. Uh, here, here's, here's fundamentally the idea. We assume, remember when we do this, we assume something and then show it can't be true. So we have an elegant program length generator here, which means that we feed it some input or some output. And it gives us the shortest program. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do the shortest program length. Chaitin's is for the shortest program length. But let me just assume that um, for here, we're actually generating the shortest program, OK? It's easier to talk about. In other words, it tells you what the shortest program is. It would be nice if we were able to write an algorithm or a computer program to do that. Given an output, we would use this um, elegant program length generator to generate the shortest, the shortest program. This would be really cool if you think about it. You wouldn't have to code anymore, right? You would just have to say what the output was that you wanted and plump this, uh, this elegant program length generator would generate the shortest program. Again, uh, in, in Chaitin's proof, he just talks about the length of the shortest program, but let's talk about the shortest program. Here is, here is, here is the following reason. First of all, uh, elegant programs get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I don't care how big an elegant program that you get for an output, there's going to be some elegant program which is larger than that, right? So there's, uh, there's elegant programs of all sizes. In fact, the length of all of the um, elegant programs is unbounded. You can make you 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 can make an output so complicated that the elegant program, which is required to generate it, is going to be arbitrarily large. Does that make sense? So, if that indeed is the case, then um, then that's interesting, and it's interesting for the following reason: if this is a piece of software that we can write. And let's say this takes take 10 uh, gigabytes, 10 gigabytes of information. And see as I go on whether you see a, a, a glimmer of Barry's paradox here. Eventually, you're going to get the shortest program. And the shortest program is eventually going to be something like 30 gigabytes. Don't forget that you can make these elegant programs as long as you want to, because there's always going to be a, a program, an output that's going to require that. Okay, here comes the rub. Listen carefully. We have used 10 gigabytes to specify the elegant program of 30 gigabytes. This program of 30 gigabytes is supposedly the shortest program that gives you this output, right? 
but we have used the elegant program generator and that only has 10 gigabytes. It's a contradiction. Again, the idea is a little subtle, but the idea is, is that we can get an arbitrarily large elegant program, say of 30 gigabytes. If we have an elegant program uh, generator of 10 gigabytes, we have a contradiction just like Barry's paradox. We're saying that this is the shortest program. This is the shortest program which um, generates this output. But now we get to the point where, no, we can only do it for 10 gigabytes. So there is a contradiction. And because of that, the elegant program generator by the simple um, logical illusion is something which can't be, can't be done. It's non-algorithmic. It's impossible. Go ahead, Sam. Uh I just have a quick question about semantics here. So the the elegant program length generator, that doesn't generate the output, right? That just generates the okay, yes. actual and, program. And I uh, I did this. Yeah, I've been right, doing just right. the elegant program generator. Right, yes, of course. Thank you. But that, that wouldn't satisfy the conditions of the shortest program, which is the output of the EPG, because it doesn't produce the original output, it only produces the program, I guess. It is. Wouldn't you need to run that program and use that information to generate the output? No, because this elegant program generator all already assumes that if you're given the output, it gives you the best input. Okay. That That's already, that's already specified. Okay. Now what Chayton does uh, let's see if I should go into that. No, I don't think I'll, I'll leave that here. Um, it, not only can't you do this, you can't do the, um, you, ca you can't do not the shortest program, but even the shortest program length is not possible. So that's something which is non-algorithmic. It's something which cannot be computed. And this again is like Barry's paradox. We want to define what was Barry's paradox, the shortest um, the, the, the smallest number that can be described in uh, 30 gigabytes. And then we just did that in 10 gigabytes. So it's very akin to the Berry paradox. Uh, Dr. Marks, another quick question. Doesn't sure. this also assume that you can create the EPG with finite information? Yeah, well, it assumes that it's algorithmic. So it's assuming, oh, right. the idea, it's assuming it's algorithmic. Therefore, it assumes that you can write the program. Hmm. Uh, and that program has to have some sort of length. Here, we're assuming that the length of the program is 10 gigabytes. You okay. can choose it anything you want to, but it doesn't matter what you choose it to be. You're always going to find an elegant program that's larger than that. So this doesn't say that for elegant programs up to a certain size is not algorithmic. It says there does exist a point where that elegant program generator does not um, spit out numbers, uh, doesn't set, spit out programs which are larger than that. Okay. So you can't do it for everything. That's just a beautiful proof. In fact, um, Chayton says he's probably most proud of this of the solution the uh, uh, of this proof of most anything that he did uh dr marks yeah i have a kind of a quick question stemming from that um so the statement that there's sort of programs of arbitrarily large complexity yes um more formally would you have to say something like these programs are sort of written in some kind of symbolic language like ones and ah, zeros. Okay, that's something we get into. So yes, you do. Incompressible strings in those languages of One of the size exist? Yes. So the question is, if you wrote this in C as opposed to Python, for example, you know, the, you're, you're comparing apples and oranges. But one of the things that Kolmogorov and Chaitin recognize that if you have something in C, and uh, you have something else here in Python, that there's always a translator. So you run it through this little translator to translate the C into Python. And the length of the program in C, we'll use this for the length of the program. And the length of the program of P is related to this by a constant. 
And the constant is the length of the translator. So what does this mean? It doesn't mean they're exactly the same, but it does give you a bound. And typically in algorithmic information theory, you consider numbers which are so big that the, this constant is uh, dwarfed out and no longer, no longer is applicable to this. But what it says is that the, an elegant program in C, the length of an elegant program in C minus the elegant program in P that difference is always less than or equal to a constant. That's what this is saying. So yes, they did, uh, everybody recognized that this is gonna be different for different programming languages, but, um, but we don't have to worry about it in the sense if we talk about large numbers, an elegant program in C is going to be the same as an elegant program in P, except for this constant, which defines the length of the translating program, which is totally independent of the contents of the program. So that, that, that constant, again, is the length of the translating program, and that remains the same no matter how long your programs are. So I think you can see as we get really, really large as say the elegant program in C gets really, really large, the corresponding elegant program in P is going to get really, really large. And that difference is going to be a very small number in comparison with the length of these two programs. So yeah, that, yeah, that's a good insightful question. I think that that's something that pops into people's mind when they see this sort of thing. Okay, let's, uh, let's go on. Now this is Kurt Gödel, and he was the first to specify the non-algorithmic. And, uh, and here, here was his, I, I'm gonna summarize it. This is an oversimplification. But Kurt Gödel came up with no matter what formal system you use, you're going to get a theorem if you, well, a little background here. He was trying to develop, people were trying to develop a theory by which you could prove all the mathematics. And there were a couple of scientists named Whitehouse and um, Russell, Bertrand Russell, which had written a, written a book trying to start very, very slowly and develop a formal system for, if you will, all of arithmetic. So they started out with some axioms and some definitions and then some theorems. And they wrote these two very thick books. I think they were called Mathematica Principa. And they were, <laughs> I've heard them described as the most important books of the 20th century that nobody has read or understood because it was so detailed, it was so deep in the weeds. And so they were trying to do this because the mathematicians, especially David Hilbert, thought that, yes, this should be done. And Kurt Gödel said, no, nope, this isn't going to happen because no matter what axioms you start with, you will eventually get to a point where it says theorem X cannot be proved. Theorem X says that theorem X cannot be proved. Now, you'll notice in all of these, there's kind of a self-reference here, right? There's a self-reference, and that happens in a lot of these logical illusions. Now, let's look at this. It's a very curious statement. Um, what if that's true? Or let's do what if it's not true. Suppose that you could train, you could, you could prove theorem X. Well, that would mean your system is inconsistent. It's almost like saying, one plus one is two, and then again saying one plus one is three. You have an inconsistency there. Whereas on the other hand, if it is true, that means you have proven that something is true, but that thing exists outside of your axioms. And indeed, this is, this is the accepted way. So if we, if we assume that the mathematics is consistent, if we prove that the mathematics is consistent, then indeed this is a truth which you can show in this formal system, but that truth cannot be proven. So that's pretty heavy. Again, this is an oversimplification. And this, uh, Gödel had two outcomes. One was the uh, incompleteness and uh, the other one was the inconsistency. And if 
this is not true and you can prove theorem X, then you have an inconsistent system, right? And you don't want an inconsistent system. You don't want to show one plus one is two and one plus two is uh, one plus two is two also. So Gödel's proof relied on some very cool math uh, using prime numbers and such, but we're not going to deal with it because that's that's a topic for another. Well, that's a topic for mathematicians. What can be showed, however, is something that was um, oh. The, Anybody know the, the, the name of this cartoon? Have you ever read it? It's XYKD or something like that. Nobody knows? XKCD? XKCD, thank you. Thank you, XKCD. And so it says, hey, hey, Girdle, uh, we're computing a comprehensive list of fetishes. What turns you on? And he says, anything not on your list. I want you to think about that. Anything not on your list, that's what turns me on. Well, you know, what do you do? Do you put it on the list or you don't put it on the list? If you put it on the list, then well, it doesn't, doesn't meet the purpose of your list. But if you leave it off, then it isn't complete. So your list either has to be inconsistent or complete because of what Girdle has for his fetishes. I always thought that was incredibly clever. clever. The guy that writes these cartoons is really a great nerd. You know, he writes at a very nerdy level. And this was one of them. Now, it turns out that Gödel's incompleteness theorem was later realized the same decade, I believe the late 30s. Gödel did his in the early 30s. But Turing, uh, Alan Turing, who is the father of computer engineering, I think modern computer engineering, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And he wanted to, he wanted to ask himself, can you prove whether a program will halt or not? It's called the Turing halting problem. So here's the idea behind the Turing halting problem. Can you write a computer program, which you, if you place in that computer program, an arbitrary computer program, your master computer program will say whether that program stops, halts, or whether it runs forever. Now it doesn't execute the code. In fact, if it runs forever, and you executed the code, you'd never know, would you? Because that program would run forever and ever and ever and ever, 20 years, and you would say, oh, it doesn't halt. And then you could look away and bloom, 20 years plus five seconds, it halted. So you never know if it doesn't halt. So this, this program does this without, without running the code. And what he was able to do is show this halting problem did not exist. The halting problem is non-algorithmic. So therefore, if you have a thesis advisor that wants you to prove the halting problem or write a computer program that, that solves the halting problem, you should totally ignore them because it's something which is proved mathematically that can't be done. Okay. A halting problem cannot be written. It is non-algorithmic, provably non-algorithmic, just like Chaitin's elegant program. There is a generalization of the Turing halting problem called Rice's theorem. It turns out it's kind of a trivial explanation, but it says uh, all trivial, all, all non-trivial semantic properties of programs are undecidable. That means you cannot write a computer program to say whether an arbitrary computer program will print out the number three. You can't do that. Now, there's some obvious cases where if you look at a computer program and the third line is halt, you know that program halts, right? But there's other cases. So the, the key here is that is that you want a computer program that says whether the, pro, whether the program being examined halts and you want that program to be examined to be any general computer program. Uh, Dr. Marks, just a quick note. Uh, there, there is a way to write a computer program that has a line that says halt, but you can have the command uh, flow so that it avoids that line. So you could like have an if false and then halt. So the you know, so you could have a, a situation where there is a halt line, but it's never called. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you an example of this. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, oh, this is something else, which is interesting. We'll get to, we'll get to answering your question in a second, Sam. These are all excellent questions, by the way. There was uh, one of the, one of the classical determinists, uh, Pierre Simon Laplace, and you guys have heard of him as an electrical engineering as the Laplace transform, the Laplace curve, and things of that sort. Um, 
he also was very instrumental in forming the metric system. And he was under the belief that the universe was materialistic. That is, if you know the position, the velocity, and acceleration of every little particle in the universe, you could forecast the future. That's one of the things he believes. But here's the interesting thing that Rice's theorem says. Rice's theorem says you can have a computer program. Now, that computer program is totally deterministic. By the way, a Turing machine cannot generate a random number. You know that. Uh, so this is totally deterministic. The computer program you write is totally deterministic. Yet, it does not imply no ability. You're still not going to know what it does. You have a computer program, you don't know if it stops or it runs forever. So being, um, being deterministic does not imply no ability. I think that that's pretty profound. Now, let me get to, um, well, let me, let me make these points here. Uh, computers can execute algorithms. The halting oracle is non-algorithmic. The elegant program generator is non-algorithmic. Much that is algorithmic can be unknowable. Uh, what else might be unknowable? If you take my course in information theory, you'll learn about the most incredible number in the world, Chaitin's number, which is something that exists. You can prove all of the problems in the world, all of the math problems in the world that require a single counterexample, and it's all collapsed into a single number. And we know the number is between zero to one. And if you have a C compiler on your, on your um, desktop or your, your programming C, that C program has a Chaitin's constant that will tell you whether any program you write is going to, uh, well, any program that has a single counter example, um, whether it's whether it's uh, right or wrong. And the interesting thing about Chaitin's constant is we can prove that it exists, that it's on your computer, but we can also prove that it's unknowable. Isn't that cool? So I'm giving you a little pitch for information theory if you wanna take this, because we cover the classic Shannon information theory. Then I really love the stuff in algorithmic information theory, the stuff of Kolmogorov, Chaitin, and Solomonoff. Okay, let's, let's take a look at some things which are um, unsolvable today. One is Goldbox conjecture, a great conjecture. Anybody heard of Goldbox conjecture? This is Frank, okay, good, okay, Colin has. Uh, this means that all even numbers greater than four can be expressed as the sum of two prime numbers. He wrote this to maybe the, the greatest mathematician that ever lived, uh, Leonard Euler. And he said, you, you know, look, I've looked at a lot of numbers and they all seem to add up to um, all even numbers or the sum of two primes. Like, um, for example, innocent, give me a number between one and a hundred that's even. You're uh, muted. Yes. 44. Okay, 44 can be written as, um, help me out here, guys. 44, ooh, that's a rough one. 40, 41, 41 plus three. Both are Dr. prime Marks, numbers. Yes. Just a, an oddity. It, do, it doesn't deal with the conjecture, but you did ask him for an even number between one and 100, so you could have chosen two or four. He could have chosen two or four. Yes, right. you're right. You're right. You're right. So it doesn't it doesn't matter. But it, I was well, then you get into the philosophical question of whether one is a prime number or not. So that's the reason we say greater than four. Good point. Good point. So here are some examples. These these Goldbox conjecture has been tested empirically up through billions and trillions, and nobody has found a counterexample. And by the way, there's a one million dollar prize waiting for anybody that proves Goldbox conjecture. It's been around since 1742, and a lot of really smart people have looked at it. Does that um, count for inflation? What's that? I don't know. What do you mean? Oh, does the prize? A million dollars. How long has the prize been there? Oh, it's been, I, you know, I don't know exactly, but I do know that there's a list of prizes. I heard a lecture by a great mathematician that he was so great, I forgot his name, but he used to offer his students um, problems that he was unable to solve. 
And he said, if you solve this, I'll give you $20. So his, his, his prizes were not as much as these other, uh, these other examples. But that is, that's true. Uh, here's another one, which is Legendre's conjecture. These are things which have been checked up into the billions and trillions. And he said, Legendre says, between uh, you have consecutive perfect squares, there's always a prime number that exists between those two perfect squares. Like, for example, if you take the numbers three and four consecutive and you square them, you're asking yourself, is there a prime number between nine and 16? And yes, there is. There's 11. There could be more than one prime. Um, down here, 11 and 12, 121 and 144. Um, yeah, 121 and 144. And 131 is a prime between them. So nobody has ever, ever proven Legendre's conjecture. There's the Riemann hypothesis. And I don't know if any of you have seen the movie, A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe. Um, he won a Nobel Prize for something called the Nash Equilibrium. And there's this one scene in the movie where he tells a math student, he said, stay away from the Riemann hypothesis and trying to, trying to prove it, it'll ruin your career. So I won't get into the reasons. This is a little bit more deeper and this has nothing to do with uh, number theory. Wow. Yeah, this is the one that offers the prize, uh, the Clay Mathematics Institute. Uh, and they verified, they verified this all the way up to 10 trillion trivial non-zeros. So the first 10 trillion solutions were done, at, they all fit Riemann's hypothesis. Now, here's the thing. I want you to think about this for a second. You remember Goldbach's conjecture? The sum of every even, every even number is the sum of two primes. Could you, and I know you could, you could write a, you could write a, uh, a computer program. Now we're assuming that we had infinite memory and stuff like that, but you could write a computer program to check between all integers, all, all I'm sorry, even integers. So we start at 10. Okay, 10 is seven plus three. Okay, let's go to 12. 12, that's seven plus five. So you could do a search for two prime numbers that added up to that result, right? Do you think you could do that? I think anybody could do this here. Now, let's look at your program and not what it does, but whether it halts or not. Because in this program, we're going to put a little exit thing that if you find a counterexample to Goldbach's conjecture, it will exit the loop. It will say, I found a counterexample and here it is. What happens if Goldbach's conjecture is true according to the halting problem? It will run forever if it's true, won't it? Because they will never, ever find a solution for that. It'll run forever. And if it halts, what does it mean? It means there is a solution that does not obey Goldbach's conjecture. Therefore, we've found a counterexample. And this counterexample shows the gold box conjecture is false. So see, this is the important, this, this is the mind blowing aspect of the halting problem. If you could, if you could um, write the halting problem, you could solve, solve gold box conjecture. But it's non-algorithmic. You cannot write a computer program to do that. So here's the idea again, write a gold box program, give it to the halting oracle and see if that Goldbach program runs forever, in which case the Goldbach's conjecture is true, or whether it halts, which means Goldbach's conjecture is false because you found a counterexample. So here is, here is an example of a program that's non-trivial, that if you were able to figure out whether it halted or not, you could, you could win big bucks. So here is what I just said. If it halts, it's a counterexample and the conjecture is wrong. If it doesn't halt, uh, the conjecture is proved. Um, Riemann hypothesis. Let me, before I do this, have you ever heard of the Collatz conjecture? This one is mind blowing. And I, I have a really, really smart student who called me up two weeks ago and he says, I have proved the Colox conjecture. 
are you ready for this? It's a simple difference equation. It says that x sub n is equal to x sub n minus one over two if x sub n minus one is even. Is that okay? It's equal to three x sub n plus one if, or I'm sorry, uh, this should be an n, yeah, n minus one, three x sub n minus one. If uh, x sub n minus one is odd. Do you, want to, do you want to know what's mind blowing about this? It always converges to one. Even though sometimes you blow up the number, three sub x sub n minus one. Uh, somebody give me a number, let's see. Uh, Colin, give me a number. Don't make it too big. Uh, 42. Okay, 42. Now that's even, so we divide it to 21, right? Now we have to multiply. That's odd, so we multiply by 3 and add 1. What is that equal to? 64. 64 divided by 2 is 32. 16, 8, 4. Two, one. And it doesn't matter what number you start with, this Colox conjecture always converges to one. Nobody has proved it. This is another one of those big, uh, big prize winners, if you can figure it out. And what would you need to do in order to disprove the Colox conjecture? You would need one counterexample. Counter yeah, one counterexample, right? Same for Goldbox conjecture. Same for the Legendre connect. Uh, conjecture where you have the square of two uh, consecutive integers, just one counterexample, and it would be it would be false. And that's what Chaitin's number does. It takes all of these problems plus a bunch that I haven't talked about that you require a single counterexample to, and it wraps it all in a very nice package called Chaitin's uh, Chaitin's uh, number. The reason I hesitated is a lot of people call it constant, but it's not a constant, it's a number because it changes from, from computing system to computing system. Um, but um, anyway, I find this very, very fascinating. But all, the, uh, all of these problems can be solved. This should blow your mind and you should say, he's a liar, he doesn't know what he's talking about, okay? Because it doesn't sound right at all. But if you know one number, Chaitin's number between zero and one for your compiler, you solve all of these problems. Can I throw in a, an interesting factoid related to that? Sure. Um, so the, uh, are you, do you know who uh, uh, John Conway was? Yeah, uh, so the game of life. Yeah, well, that's what he's known for. But um, he did a lot of work in like discovering the, the monster group. He's a brilliant algebraicist. Uh, he actually worked on this problem for a while. and was Oh, able the to collapse prove... conjecture? Yeah. Um, okay. He was actually able to prove in the general case. So if you replace that, that 2 with some uh, integer p, that 3 with another integer q, uh, and that one uh, with another arbitrary integer, you can actually produce uh, an iterative sequence that'll represent the translation function of any Turing machine that you want. <laughs> really? So, so that you can generate uh, something which is Turing complete, right? Right. So oh, that's of weird. The, of all the problems that are probably most likely to have a direct translation to something that's undecidable, um, in my opinion, this one's probably it. Well, you know, that's something else which is, which is undecidable, I, I, I suspect. Uh, see what you think. If you're familiar with Conway's game of life, if you're given an arbitrary, um, an arbitrary, oh, what do they call that? They call it ash, just an initialization. Conway's game of life is totally deterministic. And you let that thing run. Will it halt or will it, uh, will it oscillate forever? There's no way you can tell by just the initial condition. I've heard that stated as an example of something which was unknowable. Don't know if it's true, but um, if you're given an, an initialization, anyway, we're going down this rabbit trail. So let me, um, let me uh, go on. So if, if we did have a halting oracle, we could solve Goldbach's conjecture, we can solve Legendre's conjecture, and we could solve the Riemann hypothesis, we could solve the Collatz conjecture, and a bunch of other ones. Um, really fascinating.
Here's another one. I wish I remember. Maybe, maybe somebody will know what this is. You write all the primes, right? And then you take the absolute value of, let's see, oh, I'm sorry, I have to have two here, right? And you take the absolute value of their difference. So this would be one, one, uh, two, two, uh, four, two, four, two. How'd I do? Then you take the difference here again. Let's see, one. Okay, this isn't working. I shouldn't try to do this off the top of my head. But if you do this right and you keep on doing this difference, you get something where one is always the first number. It's really an, astonish, an astonishing result. I'll see if I can find that and share it with you next time. Okay, so here is the halting problem, uh, the, the, which is non-algorithmic. It's non-computable. There's a bunch of stuff which is non-computable. And it's provably non-computable. Will it halt or run forever? So this gets us to the question, are there attributes of human beings that are non-computable? I think that it's probably philosophically okay to do that, although we haven't proven this. And I think that a materialist would come along and say, no, you can't do this. You, 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 you must have a deterministic way of doing everything that the human being does. But it does appear, and bear with me here, that humans have, have um, non-algorithmic capabilities. Let me give you an example. Here are a few things that I maintain that humans have which are not computable. Qualia, sentience, understanding, emotion, creativity, and consciousness. And let me elaborate on each one of these is what, what I mean. Now, qualia is an experience. Uh, imagine a man who is blind since birth and he sees these green squares here. Now you look at those green squares and you're having an experience at least for everybody but Sam, right? Okay, so now you see these and here's the question for you. Your job is to explain to this blind man since birth, your experience, what your experience was like seeing green. Now you could give them the wavelength. You could say at little apples are green. You could say grass is green. You could give them all sorts of different information, but duplicating that experience would be very difficult, if not impossible to do for the person. And this is just one example of qualia. Another one is, 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 play, is another qualia example is pain or pleasure or something like that. You can explain it uh, and you can give examples of it, but to duplicate it, eh, you can't do it. You can't duplicate that experience. So if that indeed is the case, if you can't explain qualia to a man who is blind, how, how, how are you going to write a computer program that experiences qualia? You're not going to be able to. So I maintain that qualia is something which is um, non-computable. Very, very simple, simple example. Um, let's look at understanding. This is really interesting. <laughs> uh, one of the things that computer scientists have been trying to do for a long time, and this, uh, th this is best illustrated by John Searle's Chinese Room. Now, this is over 20 years old, but John Searle said, you know, computers can add the numbers six and seven, but they don't understand what the numbers six and seven are. Now, John Searle did not know Chinese. So he said, imagine me going into a room, and this is the Chinese room. That's not John Searle, obviously, but he goes into this Chinese room. And in this Chinese room are, are lots of books. You can think of them as file cabinets and things of that sort. And uh, everything is written in Chinese. So while Searle is in this little room, somebody comes and through the door, slips a little note. It's a question in Chinese. So what does John Searle do? He goes to these cabinets and he begins to look for a match to this question. In other words, he does pattern recognition on the Chinese and he finally finds a match. And on the card that's filed is also the answer to that query. So he copies down the answer to that query 
and refiles the card in case he needs it again. And he goes over and he slips the, the question along with his answer through the door. You following me? Now, the question is, according to Searle, does it look like from somebody from the outside, does it look like the person inside this room knows Chinese? It does, but the person doesn't know Chinese. They can't read Chinese. They have simply performed an algorithm totally void of any, uh, any, any understanding. So Searle said this is exactly what computers do, that they do not have understanding of what they do. It's a very strong argument. You can see here it's 30 years old. He proposed this in 1980 and is still an argument that stands, at least in my mind, very strong, strongly. Uh, Dr. Marks? Yeah. Just so you know, it's up to 40 years. Oh, okay. <laughs> see, some people aren't good with arithmetic either. Okay. <laughs> oh, gosh. You know, okay, one of my pet peeves is when somebody makes a mistake, just like they, just like I did, they say, oh, I'm not, I'm terrible at math. No, you're terrible at arithmetic. So I was terrible with arithmetic there. Thank you, Sam. Okay, you get the idea? At least that's Searle's Chinese room argument. And to me, it's pretty solid. Now, um, there are some people, some philosophers, this is a philosophical argument, of course, but some philosophers that are, have argued that this might be the way that the brain works. And this is just a, uh, an augmentation to the brain's understanding. Will you still have to use this result in order to get understanding? And uh, that's something which has not been done yet. Now, if you've heard of IBM's Watson, it's a big Chinese room. IBM's Watson is where you had Watson in the game of Jeopardy playing the world champions. If you think about it, that's nothing more than a humongous Chinese room where Watson had access to all of Wikipedia, everything on the web. And it could go into this humongous room, search through those file cabinets, do it very, very quickly, and come up with the correct response for the game of Jeopardy. And indeed, it did it, and they won. So again, Searle's Chinese room was manifest by IBM's Watson in a big, big Chinese room. Uh, so far, AI has no common sense. This is still an open problem in AI. And if any of you guys get any ideas how to do it, but it doesn't have any common sense. And I will explain what, uh, what the common sense means and um, also give examples of contests where AI has been challenged to have com common sense and it has failed. Uh, there is, how many know the Flintstones? I hope I'm not that old. You've heard of the Flintstones? Okay. Well, uh, Fred gets his fingers glued in a bowling ball and he can't get his fingers out. So he says to Barney, he says, go, uh, go in the shed and get a hammer. And so Barney comes back with a good, good size sledgehammer. And so Fred responds to him. He said, okay, when I nod my head, hit it. Now there's ambiguity here, isn't there? Right? What was, what was Fred referring to? Was he referring to his head or he was referring to the bowling ball? We all know exactly what it meant. This is the very interesting thing about ambiguity as far as, as far as I'm concerned. We can look at these phrases and we know exactly what it means, exactly what Fred meant. But if we look at the alternate, the pun, if you will, the other side of the pun, uh, it's, it's humorous and we can differentiate the two immediately computers would have a difficult time doing this. Uh, there's something similarly called flubbed headlines where you have this ambiguity. I'll give you a few. Iraqi head seeks arms. Now, immediately we know what that means. It means the political, the, the political leadership of Iraq wants to buy weapons. But you can also think as a big head and that big head needs arms and that's humorous. And immediately we know what the right solution is, what the wrong solution is. And the wrong solution is the funny solution. Utah girl does well in dog show. Now, I, I won't even explain it because you explain that humor in it, uh, 
the, the funniness goes away. We know exactly what this meant. And we also know the funny, the incorrect interpretation of this in terms of common sense. Barr trying to help alcoholic lawyers. Okay, there's another, there's another pun where the bar can either refer to, be referred, be, it can uh, indicate the legal bar or it can in, indicate a tavern. And there's a bunch more. I, this is, I like this one. Farmer Bill dies in house. Clearly they're referring to legislation and the legislation was about farmers and it just died in house. But it also could be this poor isolated farmer that just died in his house. Now, there's something more serious that has been an ongoing challenge to AI. These are called Winograd, Winograd schema. They are typically talked with, um, or they, they are typically accompanied by vague pronouns. Let's look at this one. You can't cut down that tree with this ax, it's too small. What does it refer to, the ax or the tree? Probably the tree, maybe the ax. Depends on how someone were to use this ax. Well, let, let's, let's go through the logic and I'll tell you what I think it should be. If you had, if you had a little ax and a big tree, I couldn't cut it down because the ax was too small. If I had a big ax and a little tree, I could cut down that little tree. So for me, um, it's, it's obvious that the it's here refers to the X. The X is too small. Because even if you had a big X, you could take down a little tree. The city councilman refused the demonstrators or permit a permit because they feared violence. Notice that the vague pronoun there is they. So who did they refer to? Did it refer to the city councilman or the demonstrators? I assume the city councilman. Yeah, it was it, the demonstrators didn't fear violence. They wanted to go out there and do their thing. It was the city councilmen that were making this, um, this decision because they feared violence. So again, we have an ambiguous statement and common sense leads us to the proper, the proper solution. And, um, and we know what the proper solution is and the improper solution is. Let's see, do I have another one? Yeah, there is something held every year called the Winograd Schema Challenge where Winograd schema of this sort are put together. And then there is a challenge to um, artificial intelligence to solve them. And the last that I read in Gary Smith's book, The AI Delusion Era, this is a few years old, but the last that I saw about this, it was still uh, a success rate just a little bit above 50%. So almost like flipping a coin. So AI had no um, no experience, no common sense in how to resolve these problems. Notice there's no context here. You don't read a story and come to a Winograd schema. You just state the Winograd schema. And all of a sudden you kind of know which one is right and which one is wrong. So this is, uh, this is one of them that um, the Winograd schema, which is an ongoing concern, and it is an ongoing concern for artificial intelligence to make sure or, or to allow artificial intelligence to have common sense. It doesn't happen. So I haven't looked this up for a while. We probably should update that. Okay, we've talked about qualia. Qualia is a type of sense, or qualia here is a type of sentious. We've talked about understanding with, um, with Searle's Chinese room. I'm not gonna go through emotion, but I will go through creativity. This is a really, really big one. And I, so let's talk about creativity. Alan Turing in 1950 proposed what people have called the Turing test. How many have heard the Turing test? Okay. The Turing test is something uh, wherein 
you know that a computer has advanced to a human level if you talk back and forth to it. Now, back then, this had to be by, by I don't know, remote. You had to submit your questions, if you will, on a sheet of paper and then have your answers returned on a sheet of paper. Today, we know with chat butts, that isn't required with voice recognition and everything. Um, and he proposed, he says, I propose to consider the questions, can machines think? Now, that's a little bit far from being creative, but can they think? Are there imaginal digital computers which would do well in the imitation game? Has anybody seen the, the movie, The Imitation Game, starring um, Benedict Cumberbatch as Alan Turing? It's, it's, it's a great movie, and it's about the way that at Benchley Park, they cracked the Enigma code for the Nazis in World War II. And the name of the movie is called The Imitation Game, but it's basically the life of Alan Turing. So this was the Turing test. Now, people have begun to do the Turing test. There, there's, a, there's a problem with the Turing test. This was noticed by Summer Bringsjord. And he said this, and I think it's true. He says, Turing's dream is coming only on the strength of clever, but shallow trickery. Versions of the Turing test know all too well that they have merely tried to fool those people who interact with their agents into believing that these agents really have minds. One of them that was uh, a few years ago was Eugene Gustman. He was a 13-year-old Ukrainian boy. Uh, let's see, check my math here. Seven years ago, right, uh, right, Sam? Seven years ago, okay. He was a 13-year-old Ukrainian boy who fooled a number of people into believing that he was a human being. Now, immediately, you see some gaming of the system. And that's one of the problems with the Turing test is that it can be gamed. Number one, the boy was Ukrainian. So if English was a second language, you could excuse some grammatical mistakes, okay? Secondly, um, he was 13 years old. So the kid hadn't matured yet. So he might give you immature, immature responses. So that's the obvious way that it's gamed. Another common feature for gaming the Turing test is if you don't know what your, if you don't know how to respond, if, if the computer doesn't know how to respond to a question, it, um, it uh, asks you a question to kind of derail the conversation to go on. So the Turing test hasn't been very successful and people are using trickery. Now, what brings Jord, who is in the middle here, he proposed something called the Lovelace test. And I really love the Lovelace test. I love the Lovelace test because first of all, it was named after Lady Lovelace, Ada Lovelace. And she was the first computer programmer in the 18th century. Charles Babbage's computing machine was something that she, uh, she tried to program, but she is often considered the first computer program programmer. In fact, there is a language called Ada, which is named after her. And here is Brings Your Test. This is in my own words. Creativity will be demonstrated when a machine's performance is beyond the explanation of its creator. Now, we have to be very careful here because, because we know that AI gives us surprising results. It gives us unexpected results. But are the results that it gives, is it above and beyond what the programmer intended? If the AI is responding in the manner that the programmer programmed it to do, it's not being creative. Any creativity comes from the programmer. So what would be some examples of this? If you, tra if you trained a, um, uh, using reinforcement learning, uh, something how to play, uh, AI how to play checkers, and then it went on in its own, without additional programming, learned to play chess, that would pass the Lovelace test. If you want to uh, AlphaGo, and this, this was something I believe that was, oh boy, what's his name? He's the head of a, um, a Microsoft-backed think tank. Who was, who was the other uh, founder of Microsoft? There was Bill Gates and anybody know? Paul Allen. Paul Allen gave 
big bunches of money to this institute. And uh, this, this is from the head of the institute. He's, he also agrees with me. If you go to AlphaGo and you, you ask AlphaGo, explain, explain to me how to play AlphaGo. Now, again, you're not allowed in any additional programming. But since AlphaGo has probably not been able to, has not been programmed to give you that explanation, it probably won't. I mean, even that is a little modicum above, and that would pass the Lovelace test. No computer programming, no artificial intelligence has passed the uh, Lovelace test as of yet. And we'll dig in more in, in that um, as we go on. Dr. Larson, I have a quick question. Yeah. Would you mind going back just one slide? So I assume here when you're mentioning beyond the explanation of its creator that you're not you're not talking about a novice programmer who wrote and cannot find a bug. Is that like if you write a program and there's a bug in it, so it doesn't do what you expect and you don't know how to explain it and you can't find the bug if you're really bad at programming? No, is no, there any no. Kind I, of, I guess I guess I'm assuming um, that that the programmer has written a program that works and is doing okay. what it was expected to do. Okay, great. And so Second. when you write a program, I that, I mean, what's that? I mean, if, if that extra check were not there, I could pass all these tests with a computer in you know, 20 seconds. <laughs> okay. Well, I should put, and Bringsword actually does this, uh, is beyond the explanation of its creator or somebody with deep domain expertise that could go in and dig in the code. So he elaborates on that. And we just found out from your question why he elaborates on that a little bit. Okay, nobody has passed the Lovelace test as of yet. Now, here, here are some of the headlines that you'll read. Uh, have, has anybody ever heard that uh, AI can create music? Yeah, there, there has been, you know, there was a big thing about jazz. And I just wrote an article about this in... Uh, for Mind Matters News. And, you know, I'll share it in the notes if you want to read it. But can it create music? And the answer is no, it can't. And here is a quick thumbnail explanation. And then we'll probably leave the uh, lecture at this point. If you have a computer program, AI computer program that generates a Baroque sonata, how do you do that? Well, you train it with the works of Bach, right? And if you train it with the, with the works of Bach, guess what you're going to get out? You're going to get out something that sounds like Bach. You're going, to, you're going to come out with Baroque sort of music. Never will you come out, if you train with Bach, never will you come out music written by somebody like Wagner or Schoenberg or, uh, you know, Met or some of, the, um, some of the other composers. On the other hand, if you, want, if you want music to sound like Wagner, you would train the AI on Wagner music. And yeah, you know, it might generate something that sounded like Wagner music, if you like Wagner music. I think it was Mark Twain that says, Wagner's music isn't as bad as it sounds. <laughs> that cracked me up. Because uh, it's very, he writes opera, you know, the ring cycle. And... German is a very rough language to sing, right? Because you've got to you got to gargle your words. It's like a duck choking on a kazoo. So that's that's kind of the argument. And this is something we see over and over and over again. AI cannot do anything outside of the data for which it was trained. And if you see it do something, that that training data is being interpolated in order to give you a new result within the training data set. So that's not that's not uh, cre creative, creative, creative. I guess we have in other words, can AI create art? This how many how many have seen this? This was a few years ago. It was an AI that was um, sold at Sotheby's for like between four hundred thousand and five hundred thousand dollars. And you'll notice way down here at the right, you will see it signed it not with a name but with an equation. Right. So it, it was generated by a computer. All of a sudden, you got to say, man, this is really, really something um, that this was able to do this. Okay, how did they get this? 
they train their AI with portraits from the masters like Rembrandt. And if you train AI with portraits of the masters like Rembrandt, guess, it's what, guess what it's gonna generate? It's going to generate portraits of the type of the style that Rembrandt did it with, okay? So I would maintain that this is exactly what the training data dictated and this was not creative because it simply interpolated stuff that had already been done. And that original stuff, the paintings by Rembrandt came from the creative mind of Rembrandt and not the AI. So the AI didn't generate, didn't generate that. Okay, I think we'll probably stop here. Any questions at all? What do you think? Uh, do you find this compelling or interesting at least? Okay. And uh, I, think, I think that the methodology and the ideas that I present are pretty solid. But the idea that humans contain non-algorithmic aspects, well, you know, that's going to be rough to solve. I mean, you think we're so used to thinking of algorithms. Everything is an algorithm, right? From driving to work, you know, in the directions or baking a cake or writing a computer program, everything is algorithms. So it's hard to think in, th in, in terms of things which are non-algorithmic. And how, do, how is, are all of these non-algorithmic things proven? You prove them by making an assumption and then finding a counterexample. That's very easy to do in mathematics and, well, computer science in general, but it's more difficult to do with a human being. And one of the things I've been looking at for a long time and have talked to a number of people about, how do we test whether um, AI is creative or not? We test it by the Lovelace test, but I think the creativity might be one. I, I, I should rephrase that. How do we prove that... Um, how do we prove that create creativity is non-algorithmic? We have no examples, but it's just like Goldbach's conjecture. They've tested up into the trillions. They haven't found a counterexample. We have tons of AI. None of them pass the Lovelace test, but that is not a proof that uh, that is not a proof that AI will never be creative. Just that we because we haven't found anything yet. Okay. Any comments at all? I have kind of a, a question kind of related to this, this problem of is the, is the network sort of memorizing the data or is it sort of just... You know, no, it, it isn't is memorizing. It, is it creating anything new? Um, well, do, it, do humans it, do that? Um, it isn't memorizing data. It's, uh, it, it's interpolating among uh, different, um, different things which it is, which it is learned. In fact, say I train a neural network to differentiate between a bush and a tree. Okay, bushes are little squatty things. Trees are a lot bigger. Um, if I do that and I just memorize it, I can replace the neural network with a table lookup, right? Which is really fast if you cache, it, cache them, right? If you, if you put in um, these random address, addresses. Um, so no, it doesn't do that. The problem is, if you had, say, a thousand pictures of me and you train the neural network on detecting me, my face, you would have to have the neural network properly recognize a face that it had not seen before and recognize it was me. But that recognition of me, of an image that it hasn't seen before, is an interpolation of, of sorts. In fact, if we'll talk about GANs sometime, generative, generative uh, adversarial networks, and we'll see that that's what they do. You've heard of these fake fake images, and there's some incredible stuff going on there now. But yeah, it's it's simply interpolating. It's not creating anything. It's just taking the training data it's been trained with and interpolating it. And I'm, I use interpolation in a very broad sense. Basically, the idea is your training data, if you think, for example, in images, you have the entire image space, which is humongous, right? And then uh, you do a few things like if, if you want to recognize dogs. So you have a thousand pictures of dogs. Well, that those dogs kind of carve out a little subspace, right, in the space of all images. And you don't have them all there. You just have one here, 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 here. It isn't exhaustive. 
so what the GAN does is it tries to go in to the space and tries to fill it in with, uh, with other examples. And so, yeah, we can do that. But again, there's nothing creative there. It's taking what has been put there and it's just interpolating to fill up the space a little bit more densely. Does that, does that address your question, Colin, kind of? Yeah, it, kind of where I, where I was trying to go with that, like, is there evidence that humans don't do that, that they're sort of capable of finding some example that lies outside of the manifold of um, maybe examples that they've seen before? Yes, like, in, we... fact, in fact, I, I first learned this from Roger Penrose, and I see it everywhere now, is that usually creative people have flashes of genius. Have I mentioned that in here? I have the feeling that I've talked about. I haven't talked about flashes of genius. Not if you go... Place. What's that? Not in this class yet. Not in this class. Okay, a flash of genius. Uh, Friedrich Gauss, Gaussian probabilities, for example, Gaussian elimination. The Gauss is the metric unit for what, flux or something like that. Uh, he, wrote, he wrote down, very interesting. He says, you know, I was working on a problem and then the other day I had a flash of genius. And he didn't use a flash of genius. He used a flash of lightning. It entered his head like a flash of lightning. And all of a sudden he had this epiphany of the solution. He said, I had no idea where it came from. We see this repeated through scientists, Nikola Tesla in coming up with the brushless motor. He recounts in his autobiography, he was walking along a beach. I think it was his autobiography. He was walking along a beach and boom, he also used without being aware of Gauss's idea that there was a flash of lightning in terms of the creativity. And he, smoothed out some sand and wrote a schematic in the sand, which he later used in his, in his papers. And we also see this in the arts. We see that uh, people have flashes of genius. And I can give you some quotes if you like, but um, not off the top of my head, unfortunately. One of them is one of the Beatles, Paul McCartney, one of the most covered songs ever. I looked it up and there's been over a thousand, I think over a thousand covers of it. In other words, people re-recording this song using their own, their own artistic uh, talent. And uh, McCartney said he woke up one morning and he had this little thing running through his head and he went over and he said, um, oh, this is nice. He went over to the piano and wrote down the kind of worked out the chords to it and he wrote it down. And they said, I know I've heard this somewhere. And many times with creative ideas, uh, that's the way it is. And I know each one of you, by the way, has had a flash of genius. But he said, I was going to I was going to shop this like if I found a wallet with a thousand dollars in it, I'd take to the police. And if nobody claimed it in a week, I would claim it as my own. So he shopped it around and said, as anybody heard this and nobody had. And so he wrote this enigmatic, iconic song. Um, wow, Matthew, it looks like you're in. Uh, okay. Matthew looked like he was on the equator there for a second. Um, so it, it turned out to be the melody for yesterday. I don't know if you've ever heard that song, but it's, uh, in fact, it was so, so incredibly popular. There was a movie released maybe two years ago called Yesterday, which was the, which was the title of that song, um, which was the title of the song Paul McCartney came up. Simon Garfunkel, one of the greatest pop songs I had, I've ever heard. I mean, the lyrics are beautiful. The melody is beautiful. Bridge Over Tub Troubled Water. Has anybody heard that? Oh, you got to listen to it. It is one of the most uplifting, wonderful songs. He says, I have no idea where I came from. It just came to me in a flash. And um, he says, and I immediately knew that it was something better than I'd have ever written before. And he said, I knew it was beautiful. And it just came in this flash of genius. I have a friend named Hal Phillip. I knew him when he was poor. It turns out that he went on and invented the modern touch screen. So if you use the touch screen, you've used this technology invented by my friend, uh, Hal Phillip. And I knew him when he was poor and now he's rich. He knows that I'm not hanging around him just for his money, okay? So, you know, we're, we're still friends. Uh, that's really really an interesting story, but for another time. I talked to him about when he came up with the idea for the touchscreen. He said, it came to me like, like a flash. He said that uh, I, I knew immediately what to do. I saw this chip that was commercially available. I knew I could use it for reasons that were not uh, 
not advertised in the in the app notes. And then he said also, he said, and I knew immediately that I was going to be very rich. <laughs> so that was his flash of genius. But you see this all across the arts, all across technology. And I, I assume that each of you has had some sort of flash of genius. In fact, it used to be US patent law that if you were to get a patent, that that patent had to demonstrate a quote unquote flash of genius. Now they have since abandoned that, but for a while that was that was U.S. law. You had to have a flash of genius in order to have something which was patentable. And of course, we all know that that went away as soon as Amazon patented one-click shopping. Right? I don't know if you've heard about that, but that was that was just one of the most ludicrous patents ever ever offered. No flash of genius there. So, can you? If this is ubiquitous across creativity, and I'm starting to think it is by looking at all these people in the arts, I have a bunch of other examples too. Bob Dylan, Hoagie Carmichael, um, uh, you know, a number. Oh, anybody know who Tom Petty is? Ah, Trevor does. Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, also a member of the supergroup, the Traveling Wilburys. Um, he says, I write songs, but you know, I never... I never look too closely where those songs come to me. They just kind of fall out of the sky. And he said, I'm afraid to look at it, to examine it, because if I do, it's all going to go away. So it is this flash of genius. Now, if this is true, this probably isn't the only source of creativity, but if this is true and creativity comes from flashes of genius, is there any way that we can write software to experience a flash of genius? that flash of genius has to come outside of experience. Uh, creativity requires that you, abandoned, that you abandon the status quo, that you abandon consensus. Uh, like Einstein, he abandoned the consensus of ether as necessary for the propagation of light. He also abandoned the idea of um, light traveling at relative speeds, depending on your how fast you were going relative to the source of light. He abandoned those two things. And great ideas come from the abandonment of consensus. What artificial intelligence does is it gathers consensus. It gathers those pictures of dogs, if you will. That's consensus. It can't, it can't slip outside the box. You've heard the term thinking outside the box, right? And artificial intelligence is unable to think outside of the box that the training data that the training data is um, trained on, and none of them pass the Lovelace test. That's probably a long explanation, but uh, I, I hope that helped. I'm not sure who, who asked that question. Okay, well, plus it's getting a little it's getting a little late. So uh, think about this, and I'd like to discuss it and see if you guys had any, any other ideas. If you had some pushback. Because this is uh, this is just fascinating stuff, and if you can come up, if you can come up with a test for creativity, or come up with an AI that is creative, I would be very impressed. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Who did we lose? Uh, Matthew. Matthew, okay, he probably had to split, but I'm sure he's going to come back and watch the video, right? Okay, we'll finish up the lecture next time, and then I'll give you just a short 10-question quiz to make sure you listened, okay? So thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay, I, I still want to say no. Yeah, okay, good.